Hello, this is Brian Allman from the Gem State Chronicle, and today I am joined by Cornell Razor, who is running for the state legislature up in District 1. So, Cornell, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a longtime member, uh, resident up here. I, I grew up here and went to grade school and high school and a little bit of college and uh, got married. I have a wife and three kids and 16 grandkids. I've worked in logging and mills and, and uh, retail, which is I've been in retail for 43 years now. I own an army surplus store in San Juan, Idaho. And uh, like I said, I grew up on a cattle ranch. So I've done, I've done pretty much a fair share of what you can do in a rural area. Um, I've been involved politically for about 30 plus years, 35 years, whether it's just locally or at this county or state level. Um, in each case, I've been involved for quite a period of time. Um, and that would be my introduction. I'm looking to occupy a seat that was vacated by Sage Dixon. So talking about the area you live in and grow up in, actually 10 years ago this year, actually, is uh, when my wife and I were married and we were married in uh, out in Spokane. I had grown up in Western Washington and was going to school out there. And we got married and our first stop on the honeymoon, we did a bit of a road trip, was in Sandpoint. And okay. that was the first time I'd ever been up there. And in fact, I've only been up there once or twice uh, in you know the very northern tip of Idaho. It's, I think it's a really neat place. I would like to come visit more often. Uh, what can you tell us about the area? What What is unique about it? What, uh, what are the people like? You know, you're looking to represent you know, those people in the legislature, what, uh, what makes it different from the rest of the state? Well, I don't know that it's different. It just has its own kind of character. Um, when I was growing up, there were lots of lumber mills and logging and cattle ranches. And uh, the face of the, of the countryside has completely changed. We no longer have that. There's very little logging, um, no, not to speak of very little, if any, mining anymore. And uh, lumber mills are gone. There's a couple in the county. I think there's Riley Creek and um, there's one in Boundary County that I know of. But uh, so the rural parts of the county are, are just typical, hardworking, rural, conservative folks like you would expect. And then the cities in this, it, it, compared to other parts of the state and to other places, our cities are small, but We've watched them grow quite considerably. When I was in high school, I believe the population of the, of the county was somewhere around 15,000, and now it's about 55,000. So it's grown quite a bit, uh, about triple in the last 40 years. Um, we have that big, beautiful lake and lots of uh, hunting and fishing opportunities. Um, we're 60 miles from Canada. Idaho is bordered on, both, on each side by Montana and Washington. One of, the, one of the trivia about the area, there's a couple of mountains in this part of the state that you can get up on top of and you can see into Canada, Montana, and Washington. So you can see three states in another country. Wow. Uh, you can't do that many places. In yeah. fact, maybe northern Vermont is the only place that comes to mind. Um, people here are hardworking. They're good folks, uh, friendly. Uh, it was a good place to grow up in, and it's been a good place, good place for my kids and my grandkids to grow up in. So I love it here, and I'd sure like to work at keeping it, keeping that kind of character, uh, at, you know, as much as I can by going to the legislature. So you said you've been involved in politics for you know, more than thirty years. What's your impressions of how things have changed? You know, that you go back about thirty years. That's what the early nineties, back when I was a child. Yeah. And I, I definitely think things have changed from my perspective, but what's your perspective on how things are different now, especially here in Idaho? So what has happened for the most part is just regulation, permitting, and taxes have increased exponentially. Um, when I was a young man, there was not even a building uh, department in Bonner County. There was no, no, no planning and zoning to speak of. And it was, it was a fine place to live anyway. Now we have a proliferation of regulation and cost add-ons to build and to own your property. Um, decisions are now made by the community rather than by the property owner through planning and zoning and commissions. 
Um, it's changed a lot. The character of the county has changed a lot. It's moved in the direction of less freedom, um, much, much more difficult to make a living. Growing up, one person in the household could uh, earn a living that would support the entire household. That doesn't seem to be true anymore. That's that's nationwide. That's not just in Idaho or even northern Idaho, but but we've seen it here. Um, when, when I was a young man, I've been married almost 50 years. When I was a young married man, my salary was plenty. My logging and, and uh, uh, other jobs that I had, salary was plenty for our family to live on and homeschool and, and uh, live a fairly nice lifestyle. That's all changed. It seems like it's much more difficult. And the face of politics has changed. Um, I think with the advent of social media, it's made politics much more coarse much more vindictive, if you will. Um, people are far more likely to say things in front of a monitor like you and I are with a keyboard than they would to your face. There's not as much face-to-face -face, um, connection as it seems like there used to be. So those are some of the changes I've seen. Um, the schools have changed. Um, growing up here, the high school, my grade school and high school education were a pretty good education. For example, in my Sophomore year, we had one of our English teachers just decide that she was going to teach um, creative writing, and uh, the high school allowed it. Uh, when I was a graduating senior, uh, our geometry teacher just made the decision. She said, if any of you were going to college, she said this in a geometry class one time, Eva May Whitehead, she was a great teacher. She said, if any of you want to, if, if any of you are going to college and you think you might be taking higher math, I'll be glad to teach a class on trigonometry. So she did, four of us attended that class and frankly it helped in my early college years. So those were the kinds of things you could do in a public school in Idaho 50 years ago that I don't think you can do anymore. So that's kind of changed. So looking at that, uh, some, some of the things that have changed for the worse, how would you as a legislator address that? Do you, do you have some specific ideas for some legislation, for some bills that could you know, maybe fix some of that? Well, I have, I have some ideas for funding schools. The state, con state constitution requires a free education for every resident. And so I have some ideas for funding. I'm going to kind of hold those close to my vest until I get a chance to, if, I, if I'm elected, bounce them off the powers that be down there that have been doing this. Um, stuff, something I haven't seen done or attempted, or maybe it has been attempted and it, it didn't fly and I'll find that out. But um, as far as legislation for schools, I am just an advocate of much more local control. I'd like to see the state legislature look into methods of devolving control back to the local school districts much more than it is already. And uh, take their responsibility to fund that education series more seriously so that uh, all of these levies and bonds uh, don't have to be submitted by local, local governments and uh, local school districts, I should say, much more difficult for the taxpayer when they have state taxes, federal taxes, and then all of a sudden they've got another bond levy for a school district, you know, a maintenance levy or a, or a salary levy. Um, I'm going to be looking at some of those things. So. Well, I know this session, um, you know, the governor came out in his state of the state address with a plan to uh, shift some sales tax over to uh, school facility fund and then use that to bond for more to you know repair and rebuild some old schools however some of the debate against it was that the schools in higher population areas the cities would get the lion's share and then some of the rural schools wouldn't um did you follow that legislation and how do you think that's i going did to not, your city i did not follow that legislation i was busy with other things but uh, i will most certainly get, if i get elected attend to those much more carefully, of course, because I will have all the time in the world to do it. I won't be earning a living up here. I'll be, I'll be uh, busy in Boise. Um, so I didn't follow those too closely, but I'm going to be studying some of those um, pieces of legislation in the off season as in preparation. I'm reading the Constitution, the state Constitution again. Um, I've got it all printed out and I've got it earmarked and, and uh, toenailed, if you will. Um, I'm looking at that again so I can uh, yeah, do a better job of, of connecting the dots in the Constitution with current statute and, and proposed statute. 
So on the topic of education, you know, as you said, the Constitution requires that the state of Idaho fund a free and uniform public school system. Uh, what are your thoughts on the different proposals for school choice and money following the student? There's vouchers, ESAs. Uh, this year, they proposed a tax credit for private school families uh, and that died in committee. You know, what, what would you like to see happen there, if anything? Well, you know, if I got the, uh, the unicorn I would like to have, it would be that the state would have some sort of method of not taxing people at all who choose to homeschool or private educate. My big concern about a voucher-based uh, education funding or, or school choice funding is that once the money goes to the state, there's the perception that it is the state's money. And when they parse it back, they nearly always parse it back with strings attached. Whereas if they never took it in the first place and the parents of the children had it left in their pockets, not taken from their pockets and then partially given back, but left in their pockets, that might work better towards uh, being able to fund school choice. Um, there would have to be some hard decisions made by parents uh, rather than because um, when money is directed to the state and then directed back and you're forced to use it for education, that's one thing. Whereas the parents would have to make the decision to any monies they were allowed to keep, they would have to earmark that towards education, but parents can do that. So. It's just one of the ideas I have is that we need to leave the money in the hands of the parents in the first place and not send it back with strings attached. So looking back at your involvement in politics, uh, four years ago, uh, you ran for legislature and came fairly close to winning, it looks like. Um, and that was right during the uh, pandemic and lockdowns and all that. Um, what was that like? And how is this campaign different or similar to that? Well, that campaign was far more difficult because... Um, Quite a few people are were frightened. Let me, uh, is that making noise? Are you hearing that? Uh, I heard something, it was kind of a squeak. Okay. I'm gonna shut, I'm gonna shut the microphone. Now, can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I can't do that because when I shut it off, I can't hear you. But back oh. to this, it was, it was a quite much more difficult because uh, people were afraid. They had been led to, they had been led to believe quite a bit of erroneous information about the supposed pandemic. And uh, so, for example, I had town halls where I was alone speaking into a microphone that was transmitting into people's automobiles so they could listen to me and then they would text me questions. I did this in Kellogg and in a few other places, because, as you know, when I was run, when I ran last time, I was still in District 7. I hadn't been redistricted back up into North Idaho. I've apparently moved three times in my life without ever moving. <laughs> Yeah, I was it's in funny District how one. borders do that. Yeah, I was in District 1, then I was in District 2, then I was in District 7, and now I'm back in District 1. So and the moves didn't cost me anything as far as moving <laughs> expenses. But uh, so it was much more difficult. Uh, door knocking was, was pretty much frowned upon. And uh, um, I, I was running against the son of a sitting legislator. Mm -hmm. And I had a number of people tell me after the election was over, we thought we would be voting against Paul, uh, not not against his son, or we would have voted for you, they said. So I'm, I'm thinking it might have turned out differently if people were a little bit more informed. It's unfortunate that that's just the way um, our elections are. Somehow getting the, the message and the information out has always been difficult, but it was even more hampered by that pandemic. Air quotes. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's kind of the, the catch-22 of a democratic system um, where you know, the people go and, you know, and vote is that you can't make people care. You can't force people to research the issues or the candidates, right. but everybody has the right to vote. So it's right. a matter of trying to get the information in front of them. It's, you know, it's, it, it, it seems like it's Difficult, I, I, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. How, how do you get your message to people who only care about politics one day every two years? Well, I have a fairly extensive email list, and uh, I send emails out like during election time. I've sent out, oh, here's my clipboard. I've sent out in the last um, couple of weeks, I've sent out for me quite a few. I've sent out 10. Um, and from what I understand from the folks that are in my email list, they forward them to others. So it's a fairly good reach. Um, I try to send out information about what's going on. I try to explain 
to people how the system works, how the swamp works, so they understand what they're doing when they actually go vote. It's amazing to me. I've talked to people at town halls. I went to a, not town halls, but I went to a, uh, a meeting in Boundary County last night. And there was a couple there who didn't know they could vote for me. They thought they could only vote for seat B or seat A. But oh, like, yeah. Yeah. And so I explained to him, well, that changed many, many moons ago, um, long ago. I can't remember how many moons ago, how many years ago. But at any rate, I explained to him, you can vote for both seats. The only place that you have to vote for strictly the person that lives in your area is your precinct committeeman vote. Yep. Um, even when I, I think when I was young, when I was still in high school, you would only vote for the commissioner in your district, but that all changed as well. So I explained that to them and they were, they were not aware of that. They were transplants from Nebraska. So I, I'm pretty sure it's the same in Nebraska. So it was just one of those bits of information that isn't taught in public school, unfortunately. I think we need to be teaching more about balancing your checkbook, changing your oil and how civics actually works rather than some of these studies that seem to have no clear way to earn a living using them. So I won't name them. <laughs> well, I, um, you know, in my experience, I considered myself politically connected, but until, oh, 10 or 12 years ago, I didn't even know who my state legislator was back at my old home state of Washington. And then I came here <laughs> and it took me a while to really figure out how everything worked, that there's 35 districts, one senator per district, two representatives, you know, how the precinct committee man system works. So, so, so it is complicated. And most people, it's just, you know, for, for me, I'm interested in it. Most people don't share that interest. You know, they'd rather watch football, spend time with their families, right. you know, do their jobs. So it's, it, it's, it's almost like a different language. But then when it comes time to vote, you know, it's, it's, you know, we've got to help them be informed and know what they're voting for. Right. And that's the key, trying to maintain some sort of a communication with them through the off time so that they will be willing to look to you when it comes time to vote. Um, so I try to maintain, I don't send out a lot of emails or a lot of communications, but I, I try to make sure people know what's going on in the community as much as possible. And uh, my last few emails have been two typed pages if I was doing it on a typewriter. So quite a bit of information. So as you've been getting out into the community, talking to people, doing town halls, knocking on doors, uh, what are you hearing from people? What are people really concerned about? What do they want you to focus on? What, what's got them um, motivated to be involved? So uniformly, not exclusively, but uniformly, what I'm hearing mostly about is Border, the border issues at the southern border, because we actually it actually affects Idaho. We have a lot of illegals in Idaho working in, in industry. And then uh, taxation. Uh, people are, a lot of people are right at the very edge of what they can afford to do. And if their taxes go up, especially folks that are on a fixed income, it's devastating to them. Uh, school choice. I'm hearing a lot about school choice and protecting the children from these crazy ideologies that want to destroy their bodies. Um, so those are the four major things that I'm hearing about. I have some other issues that I'm going to be addressing, but what I'm doing is I've started a, a, um, a document of suggested legislation. And there's only, I've only got four or five things on it right now, but I'm trying to, at least in my mind here, the items that more than that a lot of people are talking about. And I'm putting those items on that sheet. So, We'll see what happens by the time I get, if I make it to Boise, what happens in January. But, so I'm, I'm trying to listen to the people, hear what their heart is, hear what their concerns are, and see how I can figure out how I can address it. So going to that top issue, uh, immigration, illegal immigration, border control, uh, you know, we, we, we can talk about things we can do. And, you know, the governor sent some <laughs> police down to Texas to assist or I, I don't know exactly what they're doing, uh, but they're there. You know, people are paying attention to the issue. However, I noticed during debate in this session over you know various ideas, there's a lot of people who say that we can't just stop the flow of illegal immigration. We can't get rid of illegal immigrants because then what's going to happen to our agricultural industry and our hospitality industry? You know, it kind of frustrates me because I see that as a perspective of you know, saying that these jobs are set aside for not Americans, which I don't think is a very American idea. However, that is the reality in some industries. Uh, so how, how do you 
fix the issue or address the issue while not completely upending our economy as they fear? Well, there's a carrot and stick approach. And I think one of the sticks that was attempted uh, in, in the legislature this year was to remove welfare benefits from illegal aliens. Now, that's not not emergency medical care. Should they need it? We would never do that. Um, but remove a lot welfare benefits so that the magnet here is not there anymore. That would be one of the, the sticks. Uh, another suggestion that a couple made to me last night was what did they call it? Uh, well, it had to do with payments. Um, apparently, a lot of the illegals are sending their money home in the form of remittances. Money orders. Yeah, remittances. There you go. And so it was to tax those remittances so that it uh, creates a less of an incentive to make money in the state of Idaho because it's taxed, if you will. Um, another aspect would be to look at the governor began up. And I applaud it. He began a process of reviewing regulations and trying to remove regulations in Idaho. We struggle as a nation under incredible regulatory burdens for our supposed free market. We haven't had a free market since the 1850s. Um, none of us alive has ever lived under a truly free market. Um, so with our hampered free market, it makes it much more extent expensive for businesses to, to both thrive and pay their employees. If we can re properly remove as many regulations as we can at the state level, county level, and then look at state interposition in such a manner that we begin to ignore some of the stupid federal aid regulations. I won't name them now, but uh, that would reduce the burden on industry and allow them to pay a better wage. That's a long term. That's not something that's going to happen right away. Uh, medium term to long term response to that to the problem um, and I also think that we've created a narrative that only illegals will take these jobs and we're believing our own press releases if you want if you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying has it has have we really looked at it have, have I have I'm not in big ag I'm not in big dairy so I don't know maybe they really have tried to to hire other people other than illegals and it's been unsuccessful for them I don't know I suspect that it's just, we've started to believe our own narrative, whether it's true or not. So whatever we can do at the state to reduce the burden on business, as well as create these sticks that I just called them to uh, make it less attractive for illegals to come here. I think that will pave the, help pave the way to hiring more of our own people. Yeah, you mentioned the federal government, obviously, they have a lot of regulations. Um, technically, immigration enforcement is their job. However, uh, I don't see the Biden administration doing anything about it in the future. Maybe if uh, Trump gets elected again. But one of the, the biggest issues that I hear a lot of people talk about is federal money. Because, you know, you know, and I know, according to the 10th Amendment, anything not explicitly granted, any power not explicitly granted to the federal government in the Constitution is reserved to the states. But the government comes and starts handing out our own tax dollars back to states in the form of grants and subsidies and then attaches strings to them, you know, Title IX and, you know, free school lunch programs. So do you see a path forward for removing some of those federal dollars from our budget in order to get us out from under those regulations? Well, if the Idaho, if the state legislature decides to stop participating in them and then just keeps the money here at home. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure, as you understand, and anybody who's been paying attention understands that when you create an administration to administer funds that you send to them, the first thing you have to do is pay that administration salaries. You have to heat their buildings. You have to fuel their cars. You have to pay for their printing paper and their ink and the electricity in their outlets and their lights and all of those things. So creating an administration that takes care of um, some of the things that some of the state and federal agencies take care of is a huge burden. If those agencies weren't necessary, and I don't think many of them are, if they went away, well, that money would be more available for the state to use and it would be left in the state of Idaho. So the, the Department of Education came into existence in 1970. What did we do before that? Did we have nobody educated before 1970? How did we get to the moon? 
without a Department of Education. I cannot imagine. It must have been very difficult. Um, and yes, you can go ahead and keep that sarcasm in. Um, we, we fund at the federal level. I keep track of the number of agencies. Last I, time I looked last year, there was 635 agencies that we fund at oh, the federal goodness. level. And at the state level, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 um, when you look at every single agency. And I, I allege that most of them are unnecessary. That's all money that could be left in the coffers of government to or, or sent back to taxpayers. Um, much of what passes for regulation is simply creating regulations that uh, propagate and support the agencies in existence. And uh, so one of the things I'm going to be looking at is, is removing bad law. If I get into office, I'm going to be looking at for every law we pass, we should look at some statute that really has no utilitarian use and we should get rid of it. Um, but like I said, the governor had started removing regulations and I, I, I can't remember how many he took claim that he had removed, but we need to continue that. We need to move on that track and continue it, looking at business regulations that are unnecessary and remove them so the businesses can thrive more. Well, a counter so that to that, be, a, a, a counterpoint to that would be that a lot of the really big businesses, they support this regulation because it mm -hmm. creates barriers to entry, makes it harder yeah. for competition to come after them. So if you start going after those regulations, you're actually going to get opposition from, you know, the big businesses and the, you know, Association of, of Commerce and Industry and all them. You know, how, how how do you convince the people that you're you're actually supporting business by doing this? And you know, when you've got this other big loud megaphone saying the opposite. Well, it's just a matter of being able to to create the or not create, but for, further the narrative that you're you're furthering um, competition, and unfortunately we've lost track of the fact that competition, both in debate and in business, produces a better outcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, re re removing competition moves us towards monopoly. And you can't have a true monopoly without government involvement, but it's one of the buzzwords that, that frightens people. Um, and what we have been doing with big business buying up smaller business again and again and again is moving towards monopolization of, of our capital of our capital structure. Um, capitalism reverse, actually refers to the capital equipment that free market entrepreneurs have to fund, the sewing machines, the mining machines, et cetera. That's the capital that they're keeping in operation to fund, if you will, or to uh, further capitalism um, and, and create the free market. So if we remove some of the regulations that are hampering them that have no utilitarian effect, proper effect, um, yes, the larger corporations may cry about that. Okay, so they do. <laughs> uh, sometimes there's just no way to get past something like that other than to just do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, is does the legislature have the will to do that? I know that that uh, I'm not. A, I'm pro business, so I'm not trying to say I'm against big businesses. I have no problem with big corporations. I just don't like big corporations being in bed with politicians. That's all. Unfortunately, that's you know the case as it is now. You know, it seems like there's a revolving door between the executive branch bureaucracies and you know the leadership of the businesses and the business associations. Um, so it's it, it's it's a hard knot to disentangle, and there will be a lot of opposition. It is a hard knot to entangle, and yes, there will be opposition. So I will be if I if I'm in Boise, I will be looking at any allies I might have on this and. And I'm certain that based on what I've watched over the decades I've watched, some of them have already tried some of this. We just have to look mm -hmm. for a new method of doing it. Um, some way to convince and explain to the public that it's for the benefit of business. It's actually for the benefit of business, for the benefit of the people. Um, because when you remove barriers to employment and remove barriers to the growth of, of good free market businesses, you create higher wages, you create more incentive, and uh, you free up, um, you free up uh, resources that are put into shuttered because businesses shut down. I'm watching here locally in Sandpoint. People are struggling. Businesses are really struggling. It's it's hard to make a living nowadays with all the regulation and with all the uh, the difficulties that uh, both the pandemic and um, I guess I should say outside regulation have created. So. Still, there seems to be still some some uh, aftershock, if you will, repercussions from the, the supposed pandemic. 
Oh, Supply sure. chains have not come back to what they used to be. I'm a firearms dealer and I sell ammunition and I sell outdoor goods. And I've watched uh, some of those goods go skyrocketing in price. And then when the supply lines started to stabilize again, they started coming back down. Prices started coming back down. But of course, they did not settle at a price that they used to be at. They're still substantially higher than they were just four years ago. Um, yeah. So, and, and we've got inflation going on, too. And that's, yeah. you know, that, that that's something, a, a runaway train that nobody seems to know how to stop. So well, it's, there, there's an easy way to stop it. But again, it would take back. Yeah, we're uh, unfortunately, I think our country and our state is entering tough times. So I think one of the primary jobs of the legislature in the next few years is to prepare our state to weather these tough times. Exactly. And, that, yes. and that's going to require some thinking outside of the Oops, uh, thinking outside of the box. So, let's see, I'm looking at your uh, your website at the issues uh, that are most important. Uh, Second Amendment, obviously, is you know, here in Idaho, every Republican is going to say they support the Second Amendment. But um, you know, how, how what what does that mean to you? What does that mean in the you know, obvi obviously, you sell firearms and ammunition, so you have a unique perspective on this. Um, you know, is there any regulation you would support? Is there any, you know, red flag laws, uh, you know, common sense background checks, I any of those things that you support, or is it just uh, shall not be infringed? You answered the question for me, yeah. <laughs> I also, um, a, a lot of folks aren't aware that the, the Bill of Rights, I like the Bill of Rights. I got to say that at the outset so that people don't freak out about what I'm about to say, but in my study and teaching of the Constitution, the founders were loath to create a Bill of Rights. Uh, many of them were fearful that when they did that, if your right wasn't in the list, then some demagogue somewhere would say, well, you don't have that right because it's yeah. not in the Bill of Rights. So Hamilton was, uh, even Hamilton was the big government guy at the time of the founding of the convention. And uh, that was one of his concerns, Madison as well. So originally, if the compact that was put together by the sovereign nations known as the states, the 13 colonies did not describe a power, then the federal government did not have that power. Our constitution is a unique one. It is a grant of power. And if the power is not granted, then it doesn't exist. There are 32 powers for the legislature, I believe 13 for the uh, executive and 11 or nine for the, uh, for the judiciary that are outlined in the constitution. Do you think we've stuck to that? Oh no, of course not. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at a book rack that has a U.S. statute in it, U.S. code, U.S. code, it takes a half a library to support all the books that just cover the laws that they've come up with. So most of the problem is that the state, the federal government has encroached on state responsibility and states are afraid to, to push back, um, especially in the area of firearms. Um, the federal government has no authority whatsoever, in my mind, to create any firearms laws. That being said, there are lots of them on the books that we have to deal with. Uh, the real world ignores my fantasies. So uh, one of those things we have to do is we have to determine at a state level what we're really, you know, at, as a group of legislators and a governor and a, an attorney general, what we're willing to push back on. I would like to be able to be involved in helping push back more. Um, I don't believe that the federal government has authority to impose any gun laws, but they do. So what can the state do to mitigate those? That would be my question. And uh, some of that has been done at the state level. A lot more needs to be done. So, no, I'm not for red flag laws. I believe that the right to keep and bear arms, as Tench Cox said, uh, included the terrible, he called them the terrible instruments of the military. So, I, I, I generally agree. And when the Second Amendment was drafted, you know, private citizens had the same equipment that the military had because private citizens were the military. It was the militia that was called up and when, when needed. And it was expected, you know, you didn't have to go to basic training to learn how to pull the trigger because you already knew. Yeah. Uh, you're obviously from standpoint. So, you know, a major issue arose there with, um, you know, Senator Herndon and others sued the city over that incident where they had, what was it, a uh, an event, but they leased out a private uh, or a public park to a private corporation who then, or a private organization who then banned firearms on the premises. And they came out of it this year with, uh, you know, the, the, the Supreme court ruled for the city. Uh, they came out of it this year with a law that says that if you're a private entity leasing public areas, 
you can't restrict the Second Amendment unless it's you know you restrict entry, like you take tickets or something. Um, you know, do do you think that's a sufficient compromise on that, or you know, would you change that in no. any way? No, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. In in creating good law nowadays, sometimes it takes several attempts, several bites at the candy bar. So it's a start. Yeah. Well, at a, at a high level, that's a that's a debate I see a lot on uh, on our side. It's I think a lot of folks want to go, you know, throw the hail mary pass, hit the grand slam right now, uh, while others say we need to get a base hit, we need to get five yards on a on a running play, whatever uh, analogy you like. Uh, incrementalism versus uh, going whole hog, um, and, and that in comes some, up in all sorts of issues. Yeah, in some in some issues, I can live with incrementalism, and others, I I quite frankly can't. So. Well, that that brings us, you know, to the, um, you know, the big debate at the national level the last few weeks has been over abortion. Uh, Roe v. Wade was finally overturned, which is wonderful, and that returned the issue to the states. Some states are legalizing abortion till birth. Some states are restricting it entirely. And here in Idaho, we have, you know, fairly restrictive laws that, uh, you know, the left says is driving out all the doctors. Um, what are your thoughts on our current laws and uh, would you change them? So the law should protect life from conception till natural death um, against any and all attempts to kill it. Of course, I, the only exception that I can come up with, and it's not really an exception, is if the life, if the child is actually threatening the life of mm -hmm. the mother, you do every can thing you can to save them both. Um, sometimes that means that the, the child dies, but that would be the only exception in my mind. And I don't consider that an exception because a good doctor will be doing everything they can to save both as much as possible. Um, yes, it's at the state level. For me, this is is uh, this is a, a non incremental issue. I believe all life should be protected, no matter how it came into existence. Yeah. So, I, I like how Senator Herndon explained the the distinction when it comes to a mother's life being in danger. It's not really you, you, you're not just deliberately killing the child, no. the unborn child. You're you're performing triage. You're trying to save both, but you'll prioritize one over the other if necessary. And of course, once you reach a certain well, level, you know, if, if the baby can survive outside of the womb anyway, then there's no reason to kill it to save the mother. You just perform a, you know, an emergency C-section or something like that. So like for something like an ectopic pregnancy, that's obvious what's going to happen there. Sure. It's sad and terrifying and awful, but that's obvious. The mother's life, assuming the surgery goes well, will be preserved and the baby's won't. Yeah, the, I, I, I think the left and some unfortunate people on our side try to muddy the waters there. They, they, they take some really marginal cases and try and argue from that position. Um, and really, I don't think it's in good faith. Obviously, the left, they just want abortion. And, Worst case uh, scenarios yeah. make bad law. Yeah. So I think that's uh, all my questions. Okay. Is there anything that we didn't cover that uh, you want people to know? Well, I mean, I have a number of issues that I'm going to be pursuing. I tend to do stuff whenever I take on something, I take it on seriously and I, I go at it whole hog. So I'm going to be looking at sound money. I believe Phil Hart mm -hmm. tried to get some sound money bills. I worked on sound money 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. Um, we sent up here, worked on a sound money bill and I've got that. I still got that text. I'm going to bring that down with me and, and uh, get together with people who, who have that as a goal to get Idaho back on the, the right track for supporting our money with um, supporting our economy with actual commodities that have some value rather than pieces of paper that have arbitrary numbers stamped on them that continue to be reduced in, in value because of the, Fed, the Federal Reserve issuing more and more money into the M1 without ever having anything to back it. So um, I'm also going to try to work at educating the public um, as much as possible as to why that is so important. Um, I've always used, and now this is used a lot, but 20 years ago when we began using this analogy, it really opened a lot of people eyes, people's eyes. I, I worked at a gas station here in Sandpoint that's where the Horizon Credit Union is now. And back in those days, gas cost two dimes. If you have the right kind of dimes, it still does. Yeah. And that would be 
that would be my presentation and people would some people would get it some people would say what do you mean well if they're silver dimes and you have the melt value of the silver you have enough money to pay for gas at three dollars a gallon or four dollars a gallon so then they get it well, fr- it, one, one, one of the frustrations at the end of the session was when the governor vetoed the bill that would have allowed the state treasurer to invest a small right. portion of the state's holdings in gold and silver. Uh, it, it seems very short-sighted to be, you know, not looking at something like that with our, you know, inflation being what it is, the federal government being 34, 35 trillion in debt. Um, I, I assume that's something you would support. Yes, I would have supported that. What about uh, cryptocurrencies? Um, there were two different uh, bills relating to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And the reason for them getting killed was lobbying by the power companies because the bills would have stopped the power companies from raising rates on people who were mining cryptocurrency in their homes. Um, I would have been in favor of the cryptocurrency bills. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually helped, well, I didn't help craft them, but I was involved in, in up here locally, we have some people that are really, proficient and understand that very well uh, especially bitcoin yeah so they were they were really really helpful with crafting the bill that went to the state it's unfortunate that it went down but we can it's it's uh, one of those things you just you try again you, you figure out where um maybe where you made your mistakes and you try to correct those mistakes sometimes it's just it's just resistance because people don't understand mm-hmm. what the bill is actually going to do there's so so little um, proper understanding of sound, e- sound money principles in the average citizen, unfortunately, because it's not taught in the public schools. That uh, it makes it very difficult to to feel legislation that would uh, legalize. Uh, it, one of the things we could do that would be really helpful is just um, update and modernize our legal tender laws so that gold and silver become legal tender. So that you don't have to pay capital gains tax whenever gold and silver changes hands. Yeah. That would simplify things a lot with that. So, at any rate, so those are some of the things I'll be looking at. Well, good. Um, so we've got just oh, as as of we're recording this. I don't know when we'll post it because um, I'll need to record an interview with your opponent if he does agree to, uh, um, you know, to a talk. But once that happens, <laughs> then we'll we'll get it posted and people can see it. Uh, we're just, uh, like I said, after, as of recording this, we're just over a month away from the primary. Uh, do you have any big events coming up or are you just going to keep grinding it out and knocking on doors? Knocking on doors, making phone calls, going to forums. My life is not my own for the next week and a half. <laughs> I'm going to be going to a lot of forums. Um, I went to a, a meeting in Boundary County last night. We got a chance to talk. Scott was there and gave a good update on the legislature. I really appreciate his grasp of the issues in such a manner that he can reduce them to layman's terms. Mm-hmm. That's very helpful, very helpful. Um, so there's a forum tonight in Boundary County that I understand there may be three, 400, 500 people wow. show up. Yeah, their sheriff's forum up there was, I helped I helped fund that, I helped finance it, um, was uh, I think 600 people I heard showed up at their sheriff's forum. That's like half the population. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a big percentage. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of folks up in North Idaho who are very engaged. Yeah, very good showing for a population, a county with a population of 12,000, I think is what it is. So um, I've got forums, and then I've got one. We've got a Lincoln Day Saturday, and then I've got a forum the 24th, and another one the 1st of May. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. So, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me, and um as we close, uh, let us know where we can find information about you. Obviously, on the Gem State Chronicle, you go to the primary polls and it links to everything, but uh, you can also shout it out here. And then, um, you know, a final statement. So you can find me at Cornell for Idaho. That's Cornell, C O R N E L F O R, Idaho.com. That's my website. You can find me at uh, Cornell for Idaho on the Facebook page. Just type in and go to Facebook and type in Cornell Representative and it'll bring it up. Um, you can call me. My phone numbers are listed um, on the Facebook page. Or excuse me, on my web page, there's a, a contact form. You can get in touch with me. And uh, I answer. When I was a county commissioner, um, really quickly, when I was a county commissioner, one of the things I did was I created an Excel spreadsheet. And whenever someone would call or come in, I would, I would, I would uh, record it, that uh, the date, the person, the concern, the initial response, 
follow up, the date of the follow up, secondary concerns, and then final final dispensation. And uh, one of the things that amazed me is when I started calling people, I, I, I would often encounter silence on the other end and I'd say, hello. And I mean, this actually happened. People say, who called me back? <laughs> so I will call you back. Um, well, one of my favorite things about Idaho politics in the last four or five years that I've been involved is how accessible people are. Um, so many legislators and county commissioners and other elected officials are happy to talk to regular people. And that's not something I was used to. Well, I'm a regular people, so I like to talk to people like me. <laughs> cool. Well, Cornell Razor, appreciate your time. Uh, good luck. You, and we'll catch you next time.